The War of the Sexes is the title of the book I wrote that emphasized the fact that relations between the sexes in our species, just as in any other species, involve significant conflicts of interest. Now, that's not because they're not cooperative. It's because the more you have to cooperate about, the more potential conflict there is about how you share the fruits of that cooperation. And so what's important is that although, in some sense, the relationship between men and women is the most cooperative and collaborative thing you can see in the animal kingdom, it's also something where there's enormous scope for misunderstanding, for uh, conflict of interest in terms of who contributes what, how the gains from the cooperation are shared. In the book, I study a number of explanations for why women are generally paid less than men. And uh, one of the possible explanations is straightforward discrimination, simple discrimination. One of them is the idea that women and men have different preferences about the kind of work they do, so that women prefer to work in certain kinds of jobs which are perhaps less competitive, and uh, if those jobs also happen to pay less, that may explain why uh, women are paid less, and uh, there may also be certain kinds of jobs that are more flexible, and it may be that women prefer those kinds of jobs. And the third explanation I look at is has to do with different visibility. It's fair to say that the uh, evidence that old-fashioned discrimination is still operating in many parts of the labor market, I think, is much less strong than it used to be. There's still some discrimination in some areas, but it's much weaker than it used to be. What's more interesting is to understand why the fact that women and men seem to prefer slightly different kinds of work results in such different rewards. So, for example, women still prefer to have more flexible working conditions than men, they prefer to take more career breaks, and they prefer to work shorter hours than men do. Now, there's nothing surprising about that or wrong with that or disturbing about that if that's what women genuinely want to do. What is disturbing is the fact that they pay a very high price for that. So, for example, women who take career breaks to look after children uh, have, as a result, lower salaries, not just when they come back from their career breaks, but two or three decades later. And that seems extraordinary. So the explanation for that seems to be, and it's something I discuss a lot in the book, that women have not been able to be as conspicuous in the labor market. They haven't been able to make their talents count as much in the labor market as men do. Men, in some sense, when they stay with the company, when they continue to work while women are taking career breaks, they make themselves noticed much more to the very often rather masculine circles who uh, recruit people for the very top jobs, who decide who's going to be promoted when. And it's that difference in visibility that seems to be the key factor as far as our researchers have been able to find out. The main weakness of quotas is that um, they often uh, undermine the sense of worth of the people who are appointed that way because they feel that they were only appointed because of the quota. In the book, I suggest a different kind of quota where you have a quota on the shortlist but not on the actual appointment. So the idea would be that uh, instead of insisting that companies have to have a certain proportion of men and women on their boards, instead what you try to ensure is that the key appointments are made from shortlists which have reasonably balanced proportions of men and women. Now that's based on the hypothesis, for which I think there is quite a lot of evidence, that many large companies are not consciously trying to exclude talented women, they're just unconsciously not being aware of the many talented women that there are out there. And so by forcing them to look for more talented women, you make them realize something that in a way is in their own best interest, that there is an enormous amount of female talent in the workforce that is currently being under-recognized. Well, I don't live in Italy, so it wouldn't be appropriate for me to pass a detailed judgment on Italian society. I can tell you a few things about Italy, uh, such as the fact that Italy has much uh, less uh, good uh, childcare 
that uh, Italian parents are much more dependent on their parents and on their extended families to help look after children than, for example, in France, the country where I live, and that this has an impact on birth rates. It's well known that birth rates, particularly in northern Italy, are extremely low, and that seems to reflect the fact that having children is much more costly for women uh, uh, in particular than it is in other countries, notably in Scandinavia and in France. So I suppose you could say that Italian society is male chauvinist in the institutional sense, that it's not taking seriously men, uh, women's needs, and in particular the circumstances that uh, create obstacles to women who want to combine professional work and raising a family. So in that sense, Italian society almost is more chauvinistic.